That's 25 high yield facts for USMLE assembly step one, uh, focusing primarily on GI and respiratory anatomy and physiology with some general embryology. Here we go, 25. So ganglion cells are absent in Hirschsprung disease. Um, essentially, Hirschsprung disease is a, a failure of neural crest cells to migrate caudally um, in the intestine, and this leads to an absence of ganglion cells in the enteric nervous plexus, causing a constant contraction in that area of the intestine. Typically, you'll have newborns presenting with bilious vomiting, <clears throat> failure to pass meconium in the first 48 hours of life. They'll have an extremely tight anal sphincter, and there'll be no stool in the rectal vault. Um, you diagnose this with a rectal suction biopsy, and when biopsied, you will see that there's no ganglionic cells in the sub mucosa once again because the neural crest cells were not able to migrate there. Imaging will show distended bowel loops because everything proximal to this um <clears throat> this contraction um, will be distended because nothing can move past it. This can be associated with RET gene mutations, and it's particularly high yield to know that there's an increased risk in trisomy 21 of having Hirschsprung's disease. And you can also acquire Hirschsprung's disease um, from Chagas disease as a result of the amastigote destruction of the ganglion cells. Um, also, another name for Hirschsprung's disease is congenital megacolon, so you might see that on, um, on some examinations. 24. Pyre's patches are found in the ilium. So the, this lymphoid aggregate of tissue here that you see um, that's uh, circled and in this box, those are Pyre's patches. And it's particularly high yield to know that these are found in the ilium and they contain dendritic cells, B cells, and T cells. Um, specifically, they're found in the lamina propria and the ileal submucosa. 23. Intestinal stem cells are located in the crypts of Lieberkin. Um, these are the um, divots down here at the bottom that you see, and these intestinal stem cells will divide to replace all of the cells of the intestinal epithelium every five days. You can find the crypts of Lieberkin in both the small intestine and the large intestine, and they're particularly susceptible to chemotherapeutic agents because of the um, epithelial cell turnover. 22. The mid gut herniates through the umbilical ring during week six. It's also how you'll know that the mid gut returns back into the abdominal cavity in week 10. While it's outside of the abdominal cavity, it's doing a 270 degree rotation um, to basically present the um, small intestine, large intestine, um, all in the right places. So you can see that here. It's most important to know the, the timeline, week six and week 10. 21. <clears throat> the splenic flexure and rectosigmoid junction are watershed areas. Um, so essentially what we mean by watershed areas, and you might be familiar with this term um, from cerebral vasculature, there's also watershed areas. It's essentially where two arteries uh, meet, in this case, the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric artery at the splenic flexure. And um, this zone is superior mesenteric artery, and then this zone is inferior mesenteric artery. And there's this area in between where it's, you're not quite getting as much perfusion to that area um, because they just don't cover enough ground to get to this, this most distal area from both of the arteries. If you have atherosclerosis of the superior mesenteric artery, it's, it's more common to get um, ischemia to these watershed areas, uh, particularly the splenic flexure. And um, one of the signs you can see on imaging is uh, the thumbprinting sign when given a barium enema. So here you can see that there's some contrast from the barium enema. And you can see there's a stricture, uh, what appears to be a stricture here from an ischemic colitis at the splenic flexure. 20. The right coronary artery supplies the pacemaker of the heart, or the SA node, as well as the AV node. So I know this isn't a cardio video, but I decided to put this in here because I didn't. I don't think I talked about this in my cardio video. So the right coronary artery supplies the sinus and the AV node. Um, it has a, a branch here that you can see branch to AV node, uh, excuse me, branch to SA node. And um, if you have a narrowing of that vessel, that can lead to cardiac arrhythmias because it supplies the uh, the sign, um, the SA and the AV node. 19. The azygous vein connects the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. So I don't know about you guys, but I remember at the very beginning of medical school, I had a really tough time understanding the um, function of the azygous vein, and um, it always confused me. But essentially, it can act as an alternative pathway for the deoxygenated blood um, that's returning to the right atrium um, from the superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. So essentially, if one of these is blocked, the azygous vein can act as a conduit for blood to get to the right atrium. So that's kind of the way, that's kind of the shortcut way to think about it. 18. Pneumothorax chest x-ray. So I just put this on here because it, I know that there's a lot of imaging that, that can be high yield. This is one of them for step one through three. So we see here that there's um, no lung markings on this side of the lung. It's completely blacked out. Here you can see these lung markings. Um, so this is um, what would be a rather obvious pneumothorax. And this occurs when there's air that enters the pleural cavity. So the accumulation of that air puts pressure on the pleura and pushes the lung down so it collapses your lung. And again, the, the signs to look for are no lung markings. And in this case, we can also see that there's some tracheal deviation. If there's tracheal deviation, we call that a tension pneumothorax. 
So, that, so there's a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, which will typically occur in a tall, thin male or possibly a male that has uh, Marfan syndrome. They typically will be younger in their 20s or 30s, and that's going to be because of a rupture of a subpleural apical blood. It's particularly high yield to know that. Secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, pneumothoraces can occur with there's an underlying lung pathology like COPD, trauma, uh, or pneumonia. And again, tension pneumothorax, you see the tracheal deviation away from the side of the pneumothorax because of the increased pressure. Physical exam findings you'll typically see with the pneumothorax include decreased or absent breath sounds on that side, hyperresonance to percussion, and decreased or absent uh, tactile fremitus. 17. C3, C4, C5 keep the diaphragm alive. So these are the um, spinal origins of the phrenic nerve. Injuries to the diaphragm or the phrenic nerve can result in respiratory abnormalities. 16. Barry aneurysms occur in the anterior circulation of the brain. So barry aneurysms are also known as saccular cerebral aneurysms. They're most commonly at the junction of the anterior cerebral artery and the anterior communicating artery in the circle of Willis. And here you can see that the, the anterior cerebral artery is here. And between them, we have the anterior communicating artery. And 40% of all saccular aneurysms are located here, 34% at the middle cerebral artery. But I would remember this anterior communicating artery aneurysm um, as, as the primary location of barry aneurysms. One of the physical exam findings that you might see in patients that have this is bitemporal hemianopsia. I remember that's where both of the... Um, uh, the lateral sides of the visual field are blocked, and this will happen because there's pressure being put on the optic chiasm from this anterior communicating artery aneurysm. These barrier aneurysms are the most common cause of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages. Remember, subarachnoid hemorrhages is when you get that thunderclap, worst headache of your life that comes on acutely, and here we can see what a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage would look like. Um, as opposed to um, such things like an epidural hematoma, which would be a concavity on the side here, or a subdural hematoma, which would be a convexity uh, on, on the side of the brain. Also note that it's particularly high yield to remember that autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is associated with these uh, berry aneurysms. Fif <clears throat> 15. The inferior laryngeal artery travels with the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So one particular high yield nerve to know is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It provides motor innervation to all intrinsic muscles of the vocal cords except for the cricothyroid. It also provides sensory innervation inferior to the vocal cords. The superior laryngeal nerve is the nerve that will provide motor innervation to the cricothyroid. Um, so that's a common misconception and a commonly asked question are questions that relate to either severing of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or which nerve is innervating the cricothyroid muscle. Now, if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is severed um, and it's unilateral severing, typically you, the symptom that will occur is usually hoarseness. If you have bilateral paralysis of the recurrent laryngeal nerves, um, you, that becomes more of a medical emergency requiring a tracheotomy to secure the airway because you really have no innervation to a tremendous uh, part of your vocal cords. Um, note that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve um, and the right branch off of the vagus nerve. The left wraps here under the arch of the aorta, whereas the right is a little bit more superior before it comes back up to the larynx. Thyroid surgery complications um, will typically involve some kind of damage to a nerve. It could be the superior laryngeal or it could be the recurrent just based on the location of the nerves. Also note, the superior laryngeal artery travels with the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. So the superior laryngeal artery with the superior laryngeal nerve and the inferior laryngeal artery with the recurrent laryngeal nerve. 14. Type 2 pneumocytes secrete surfactant. Type 2 are the cuboidal alveolar cells. They contain lamellar bodies. They secrete surfactant. The whole purpose of surfactant is to reduce alveolar surface tension. They prevent the alveoli from collapsing. This is essential during breathing because um, it reduces the surface tension of that thin layer of water that covers your lung epithelium, and that prevents alveolar collapse at the end of expiration, and it helps reduce the work of breathing. Type 1 pneumocytes are the thin squamous cells lining the alveoli. Th 13. Okay, guys, so I know this one's a busy slide, but I just put lung volumes, um, and I made it for completeness, but I'm going to give you my way of simplifying this, and if you get confused by anything I say, you have the formal explanations here on the side. Essentially, I always start any question that involves lung volumes with just looking at the tidal volume. If you can remember that's 500 mils, great. Um, as a first or second year medical student, it's okay if you don't know that typically. They're probably not going to ask that, but you always start here with the tidal volume. Then if you take... Um, your max inspiratory effort, that will give you your inspiratory reserve volume. Max expiratory effort, that will give you your expiratory reserve volume. So if you can remember that, you've got these three. The only other thing is the residual volume, which is the volume that you just can't get out of your lungs. It always stays in your lungs even after max expiration. So those are your first four volumes. Now, if you add multiple volumes, if there's two or more volumes combined, that's called a capacity. So then we get to our capacities. So the inspiratory capacity, if you just draw a line down the middle here, you have your inspiratory capacity and your functional residual capacity. Okay, the inspiratory capacity is just your resting tidal volume, so if you take a regular expiration and then you take a big breath all the way in, that's your inspiratory capacity. Your functional residual capacity is essentially the volume of gas that's left in your lungs following your normal expiration. So if you just take a regular normal breath and breathe out, you're going to be here, and that's how much volume is left in your lungs.
Okay, your residual volume is how much is left after you take a max expiration. Your FRC is how much is left after just a regular expiration where you're not using your maximum effort. So if you can remember resting tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, and then whatever's left is residual. And then you draw a line through the middle of that. You have your inspiratory capacity, FRC. Then the last two are pretty easy. Total lung capacity is just the total of all of these volumes. Vital capacity is the total of the top three, and it doesn't include the residual. So that's my way of simplifying the lung volumes. The one that seems to come up the most on questions is the functional residual capacity, just because it seems to confuse people for whatever reason. But if you're able to kind of break these down, break the volumes down in the way that I just described and the capacities um, as, as I did, um, that seems to work for me personally, but um, hopefully that will simplify some of it for you. 12. Lung diffusion capacity is decreased in emphysema. So essentially, remember, emphysema results in a decreased elasticity and an increased compliance because of the alveolar wall destruction. And normally, elastin is going to function to keep these membranes open. As these membranes are destroyed, you're going to get a decreased alveolar capillary membrane surface area. So there's less area to diffuse oxygen. Smoking is the most common risk factor for emphysema, and that will typically result in a centra acinar emphysema. You can also have patients that have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency a signal for that is someone who's like 30, 25, who starts getting emph emphysema. You're not going to see that typically um, from smoking, because smoking will take years and years of history before you start to become emphysematous. pan emphysema is seen with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and one other key you can look for is cirrhosis. The reason people with antitrypsin, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency get cirrhosis is because the alpha-1 antitrypsin is normally made uh, in the liver, and if you can't release it from the liver because it's defective or there's a deficiency of enzymes that are needed to synthesize it, you result in having a hepatotoxicity that eventually gives you a cirrhosis. Um, other um, conditions that can cause a decrease in the um, diffusion capacity are conditions like anemia because you just don't have enough for blood cells to transport the gases, pulmonary edema because you have all this fluid in your lungs and that's hindering gas flow, pulmonary fibrosis uh, because you'll have a thickened alveolar capillary membrane, and diffusion capacity determination is essentially um, how we determine how much oxygen is going across the um, alveolar membrane. And so the way that we do that is we can have a patient inhale a predefined amount of carbon monoxide, so an amount that we already know, and then we have them exhale and we see how much of that is measured. And then we just determine the difference by subtracting how much was inhaled versus how much was exhaled. And that gives us an idea as to um, the diffusion capacity along that gradient. 11. The AA gradient is the difference between the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and the arterial blood. So the formula essentially is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli minus the oxygen in the arterial blood. Normally this is about 5 to 10 in young, young adults. It can be as high as 15 to 20 in the um, older adults and the elderly. Causes of the increased gradient, uh, as you can see, are age. If there's fluid in the alveoli, then there's not going to be as much diffusion capacity for oxygen as we said in the last slide. Also. Um, We'll talk about VQ mismatch in a little bit. That can also cause an increased gradient, um, and if there's right-to-left shunting. So if you're bypassing the lung, there's not as much opportunity for oxygen to diffuse across. The AA gradient, importantly, remains normal in hypoventilation and high altitude. So um, the idea behind this is if you're you know, taking a drug that slows your breathing or if you have a neuromuscular disorder, there's no issue with diffusion. You're just breathing less frequently, but your actual gradient going from the alveolar sac into the uh, capillaries here is not disturbed at all. So the AA gradient won't be disturbed. If you have, or if you're at a really high altitude, the oxygen that you're breathing in might have a lower percent of oxygen, so the FiO2 might be lower, but the actual amount of oxygen that comes into the alveoli and then into the capillary sac will not be altered because this, um, this barrier has not been perturbed. Only in conditions where there's fluid here or there's fibrosis or there's a shunt that prevents oxygen from getting across will have a high AA gradient. 10. Ten. There are two types of VQ mismatch, dead space and shunting. Um, it's important to know that the V in VQ mismatch is essentially the amount of ventilation or airflow that we're getting into the lung, and the Q is the perfusion of blood through the capillary. So ideally, um, you know, there's a VQ ratio of about 0.8. Um, when you're exercising, this can get as high as 1 as you, as you activate some of the um, capillaries that are in the base of the lung. It's also important to note that perfusion is highest in the lung bases due to gravity, and the mean arter pulmonary arterial pressure is about 10 to 14. But I made a table here to kind of summarize essentially the um, differences between VQ mismatch, because I know this is a really confusing topic for some people. So we have dead space and shunting. Those are the two things you should be thinking about with VQ mismatch. So with dead space, you're thinking of things like a pulmonary embolus that's blocking the capillary or cardiovascular shock, where you're just not getting enough blood to the capillaries in the lungs so that they can get oxygen. So essentially, in both pulmonary embolism and cardiovascular shock, you have poorly perfused alveoli. So you're, you're not getting enough blood to that barrier so that you can get oxygen into the blood. And because you're not getting enough blood there, you have oxygen in the lung, but it's just not getting in the blood. So we say it's wasted 
oxygen, wasted ventilation. So your ventilation is there, but the perfusion is not. So the ventilation is much higher than the perfusion. So this gives you an increased VQ ratio, and some people will say that it's a VQ ratio approaching infinity. Shunting, on the other hand, occurs in conditions like pneumonia, where you have fluid in your lungs, or atelectasis, where you have collapsed alveoli. Cystic fibrosis um, is a similar concept to pneumonia where you have all this fluid in your lungs, pulmonary edema, there's fluid in the lungs, acute respiratory distress syndrome, there's fluid in the lungs. And essentially the concept here is you have really poorly ventilated alveoli. The oxygen can't diffuse across that AA gradient, as we said in the previous slide. So there's perfusion of the lungs. The, the perfusion of blood is there in the capillary. It's just you can't get the oxygen across the barrier. So in this case, the ventilation uh, of that oxygen is really low. It can't get across that that gradient, but the perfusion of blood is fine. There's no issues with that. So in this case, if the V is low and the Q is really high, it's going to bring the ratio down. So you're going to have a decreased VQ ratio, and some people will say that this ratio is approaching zero. Nine, chronic hypercapnic patients have a respiratory drive that's driven by a low partial pressure of oxygen. The strongest respiratory drive under normal conditions on a normal person is an increased PCO2. So if your PCO2 is elevated, <clears throat> that's going to cause you to breathe faster so you can blow off the CO2. However, if the CO2 gets high enough, typically around 70 millimeters of mercury, your respiratory center um, basically undergoes something called CO2 anesthesia, which is almost like a tolerance to CO2. So it's no longer responsive to CO2. Rather, it begins to become responsive to a low PO2. Why is this important? The idea here is if you have a COP patient that comes into the ER and their pulse ox is at 92 and you start to put them on 100% oxygen to bring them to 100%, they will probably become apneic. They'll stop breathing because their respiratory drive is driven by their PO2 and not by their PCO2 because they're a chronic CO2 retainer. Eight, lung compliance is increased in emphysema. We talked about this earlier. The lung compliance is essentially that loss of elastic recoil um, that occurs because of the degradation um, of the alveoli. Lung compliance is decreased in pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary edema, and that's due to lung, uh, increased lung stiffness. Seven, small respirations occur in metabolic acidosis. Again, I apologize. This is a pretty busy slide. I tried to be thorough, though. small respirations uh, essentially are um, consistent, very deep breathing at a normal or it could be at an increased rate. They're commonly synonymous with DKA, but they're not pathognomonic for it. Here's an image of what you would expect in small respirations. Very fast, um, consistent breathing. Cheyenne Stokes respirations are cyclic, spindle-shaped. We say crescendo, decrescendo breathing with intermittent periods of hypoventilation and apnea. That last part is really important. So you can see here um, we have this breathing that seems like it's um, increasing, increasing to this point, and then it kind of comes down, and then it just becomes apneic, and then we go through this cycle again and again. This typically occurs with damage to respiratory centers, so if you have like a stroke um, or trauma, <clears throat> or it can occur in heart failure. I'm not sure how to pronounce this last one, Bihat respirations. These are irregular breathing followed by regular or irregular periods of apnea. So here you can see um, just completely irregular. There's no real pattern. And then there's these periods like we see with the Shen Stokes where there's just, um, you know, apneic uh, periods without any breathing. And this can typically occur if there's an increased intracranial pressure, again, with stroke or if you're uh, taking um, a high dose of opioids. <clears throat> and then I also included for completeness these agonal respirations, um, which are labored breaths. Uh, and then gasping, myoclonus, and grunting that can occur often um, occurs right before someone is um, dying, essentially, after conditions like a cardiac arrest. So around one minute after you have a cardiac arrest, you can have these um, agonal respirations. And also note something that's more common that you'll see is just rapid shallow breathing. So these, this is shallow breathing here. It's where you're uh, breathing, breathing with a very low tidal volume, and this will occur in conditions where you have, like, rib fractures or where you're weaning someone from mechanical ventilation, um, or maybe it could just be someone that is an asthmatic, uh, COPD, someone with an obstructive problem process. Six, the embryo is most susceptible to teratogens from week three to eight. And remember, in week three to eight, this is when the embryo is undergoing organogenesis. Five, all three germ layers arise from the epiblast. So here we can see the epiblast, the hypoblast, and the trophoblast on the outside. Um, so the ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm are all coming from this layer. The hypoblast will um, create the yolk sac and the extra embryonic mesoderm. Also note the amniotic cavity, which will arise in here. It also comes from this epiblast tissue. Four, neural tube defects uh, result in incomplete closure of the neural tube. Um, typically, these are caused by a decrease in folate in pregnancy. The two most common are anencephaly and spina bifida. Anencephaly is due to failure of the rostral tube, spina bifida, failure of the caudal tube. Also, <clears throat> the nucleus pulposus of intervertebral discs um, is formed from the embryonic uh, notochord, and the nervous system comes from ectoderm. There are plenty more um, embryonic terms. I didn't include them all here, but I'm sure you can look them all up and memorize them. I just, I just included what I thought was the most high yield, three. The parenchial arch derivatives. So there are 
actually five arches because the fifth arch degenerates so very quickly through these <clears throat> the first arch is when we think about chewing we think about the mandible cranial nerve v2 and v3 responsible here this is meckel's cartilage neural crest cells um, can fail to migrate and treat your collins syndrome i actually have to move this picture so you can see that treat your collins syndrome results uh, from underdeveloped zygomatic bones it's a mandibular hypoplasia sometimes you can see some lower eyelid columbomas and malformed ears i put a picture here because when i see these sometimes i can remember some of these um, images and associate them with these conditions now, Pierre Robin syndrome is also um, from malformations with the first arch. The difference here is Pierre Robin uh, uh, children will typically have small jaws and their tongue seems to fall back in their throat and they're choking and they have difficulty breathing. I like to remember this picture here because I'm thinking of difficulty breathing, not so much um, the major facial malformations that you can visibly see here with Treacher Collins syndrome. And that's one way to kind of distinguish the two. The second arch is responsible for facial expression. This is all cranial nerve seven, Reichert's cartilage. The, typically, the um, pathology you can see here is the congenital pharyngocutaneous fistula, which is essentially a persistence of a cleft and pouch. The fistula occurs between the intertonsillar area of the neck and the external neck. It's found along the border of the sternocleidomastoid mastoid most typically, um, and it's very likely to get infected. I'll talk a little bit about this in a few slides. The third arch is cranial nerve 9. The fourth and the sixth are responsible for swallowing and speaking. Of course, this is cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve 2. The inferior parathyroid glands come from the third pouch, and the superior parathyroid glands come from the fourth. This is kind of tricky. This it's confused me somewhat. So here's the third pharyngeal pouch, pouch. Excuse me. Here's the fourth. So the fourth is going to go up, and the third is going to go down. So the third pouch is going to be down here with the inferior parathyroid glands, and the fourth pouch is going to be up here with the superior parathyroid glands. Also, for completeness sake, the first pouch is responsible for the middle ear, which comes from endoderm. The second pouch is responsible for the palatine tonsil. One. A persistent cervical sinus is equivalent to the branchial cleft cyst. It's in the lateral neck. Remember, these cysts do not move with swallowing, as opposed to the thyroglossal duct cyst, which is in the midline and does move with swallowing. So that's one way to distinguish those two. The first cleft, uh, for completeness sake, is um, the external auditory meatus. So remember, the first cleft is the external auditory meatus. Going back, the first pouch is also in the ear, but it's in the middle ear. So that's kind of how to remember the ones. They both have to do with the ear. The second through the fourth cleft are uh, for the temporary sinus derivative, and that's where we get our brachial cleft cysts. And again, these are prone to infection, so they're a clear indication for operative treatment if found. I also added two bonus uh, things in here that I saw last minute that I thought would be important to talk about. More, they're a little bit more simple things you might already know, but just to remind you, situs inversus is associated with Gartagner syndrome, primary ciliary dyskinesia, and here you can see an x-ray of that. The heart is flipped, as well as some of the abdominal organs, the livers on the other side here. Also, bonus question, or bonus topic, excuse me, is persistence of the vitiline duct in a Meckel's diverticulum. So essentially what happens here is you have this, this uh, um, your midgut is going to stay connected to the yolk sac via remnants of this duct. It's going to pull out this part of your bowel, and so it's going to uh, essentially leave a part of the bowel that um, can eventually have gastric mucosa cells uh, line it and then produce um, some gastric acid and eventually cause bleeding into the bowel. And so it Typically, the presentation here is a child with painless rectal bleeding. Also note the vitiline duct is also called the omphalomesenteric duct. The terms are synonymous. The other important thing to remember with Meckel's diverticulum is the rule of twos I put here for your viewing pleasure. I won't read through all of them, um, but it's important to look through these. Um, I certainly know uh, many people that have had questions about Meckel's diverticulum on a lot of the um, practice exams, so this seems to be a uh, very high-yield topic as well.